2 Samuel, part 3. Um, this will be Bible study lecture number 9 of this series. Again, this was all one book in the beginning. And it has been split, but uh, we are trying to keep it in order here so that you'll know how to follow up on this. But In our last lecture, we had seen that um, Mephibosheth which was the son of Jonathan, had been brought to David. He was the last of the house of Saul. And uh, David took good care of him because he was the son of Jonathan, whom David loved as a brother. And um, we had also seen that um, Harazon, the son, or the, uh, or excuse me, um, the king of the children of Ammon died, and Hanan, his son, reigned in his stead. In his stead, that is to say. And um, David has sent messengers to try to show kindness to this one. But this king's um, advisors, uh, political advisors have told him David is doing nothing but trying to spy out the country so they uh, shaved off half the beards of the men and uh, cut their skirts up to their buttocks and sent them away shamefully and they came and told David of it and um, now we're going to see that there's going to be trouble between them on and um, the children of Israel, David, King David. And we're up to this point now in 2 Samuel to where we're going to begin uh, chapter 11. And this will also be the beginning of the downfall of David. A man after God's own heart, and um, even though he was a man after God's own heart, much like Saul was in the beginning, Ultimate power corrupts, and uh, this is one reason why God, who is the king over Israel, wanted to be the king over Israel and not have a man-king over the children of Israel, because our father knew that when a man gets in a position of authority and power, that uh, it can change him, it can turn him to where he loses his uh, perspective and his objectivity and uh, follows after his own wiles and lusts and desires which David was still a fair man but he's going to do something very bad here and um, he's, he's going to be paid back for it so we're going to begin in second chapter, or, or the second uh, Samuel chapter eleven and verse one. And before we begin, as always, let us go to our Father's throne on bended knee in prayer and ask our Father for guidance and wisdom as we study this His precious Word. Heavenly Father, we come before you this day. And we ask, Father, that you open our eyes and ears to the truth. That you reveal to us, through type and example, of the events that happened in these times, how we ought to conduct ourselves and show us the lessons learned, the hard lessons by this one David and such as Saul, and, in fact, the children of Israel. And we ask that you reveal to us, Father, the deeper secrets of your word so that we may know and understand by type and example and analogy and even literal the truth of your word and what you would have us to glean from the study of it. And we ask also, Father, that you open the eyes and ears of those who study with us that they too may receive truth, wisdom, and knowledge. As they study your word diligently and go chapter by chapter and verse by verse with open minds and open hearts 
doing their best to please you, Father, in reading this, the letter that you've written to us. And we ask these things, Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah. Amen. So, Second Cham- uh, Samuel, chapter 11 and verse 1. And it came to pass, after a year was expired, at the time when the kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon, and besieged Rabbah, and David tarried still at Jerusalem. In other words, uh, David sent Joab to take care of the Ammonites after what they had done when he tried to show kindness to them. Verse 2. And it came to pass at evening tide that David arose off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. In other words, the, the house that had been built for him out of cedar wood. And from the roof he saw a young woman bathing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. Verse 3. And David sent and acquired, inquired after the woman. And one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Verse 4. And David sent messengers and took her. And she came unto him, and he lay with her. Now, first of all, David is breaking a cardinal rule of the Torah, which he knows very well, in lying with another man's wife. But she was beautiful, and um, as it is with men, sometimes their uh, male organ overloads their brains, and David was no different. He was a man um, chosen of God, but he's still a human being in human flesh and subject to all the fleshly wiles thereof. For she was purified from her uncleanliness. And she returned unto her house. Verse 5. And the woman conceived this Bathsheba and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Verse 6. And David sent Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. Verse 7. And when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did. In other words, he uh, wanted Uriah home so he could go lie with his wife so that his sin, David's sin would not be discovered but he puts it under the skies of I want to know how the battle's going with Joab and you know I brought you here to report to me and how the people did and how the war prospered in other words it's all a ruse verse 8 and David said to Uriah go down to thy house and wash thy feet and Uriah departed out of the king's house and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. In other words, he uh, sent him with a, a pile of food. Verse 9. <coughs> Excuse me. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of the Lord and went not down to his house. Verse 10. And when they told David, saying, Uriah went not down to his house, David said unto Uriah, Camest thou not from thy journey? Then why didst thou not go down to thine house? In other words, David's hoping he'll go down there and lie with his wife, so that the child will be thought to be his, instead of David's. Verse 11. And Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Then shall I go to mine house and eat and drink and lie with my wife? As thou livest and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. In other words, this man Uriah was a loyal, loyal man. In, in fact, the only thing you can say is, what a guy, you know? Verse 12. And David said unto Uriah, or to Uriah, 
tarry here today also, and tomorrow I will let thee depart, you know, back to the battle. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day, and on the morrow, verse 13, when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him, and he made him drunk. In other words, he's hoping the uh, alcohol in the system is going to get him a little bit giddy and want to make him go home to his wife and have a little fun before he leaves. And at even he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of the Lord, but went not down to his house. Verse 14. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. Now, this is a very cruel thing that David is going to do here because wait till you hear what the letter says. And he's going to send it by the hand of Uriah. Verse 15. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. In other words, put him in the place where the battle is the worst and then back up away from him leaving him alone outnumbered so that he be smitten and die and he sent this letter by the hand of Uriah to Joab and Uriah was so loyal to the king till he didn't read the letter he didn't know what it said he was a man of duty verse 16 and it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that the valiant men were. Verse 17. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab. And there fell some of the people of the servants of David. And Uriah the Hittite died also. In other words, David has committed murder here. He's not done it himself by his own hand, but he has planned it out to hide his own sin. He has caused this man's death who was a loyal, loyal man to him and a servant to God, though he be a Hittite. Verse 18, And Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war. Verse 9, and charged the messenger, saying, When thou hast made an end of telling the matters of the war unto the king, verse 20, that if it be so, the king's wrath arise. And he say unto thee, Wherefore ye approached so nigh unto the city when ye did fight? Knew ye not that they would shoot from off the wall? In other words, they would shoot arrows down upon you. Verse 21. Who smote Abimelech, the son of Jebusheth, did not a woman cast a piece of a millstone upon him from the wall that he died at Thebes? And he went nigh unto the wall. In other words, why do? basically what he's saying here is, why did you get so close to the wall that they could shoot down on you and kill so many of our people? Why went ye nigh to the wall? Then thou shalt say, Thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. In other words, Joab's going to use this as a little piece of uh, a little piece of uh, blackmail here. In other words, if the battle has gone badly and David gets upset with Joab, Joab's got a little ace in the hole here, because Joab knows that David sent this letter to him, and uh, he knows this will cool David down real quick. Verse twenty-two. So the messenger went and came and showed David all that Joab had sent him for. Verse 23. And the messenger said unto David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out unto us into the field, and we were upon them unto the entering of the gate. Verse 24. And the shooters shot from off the wall upon thy servants, but the king's servants be dead, and thy servant Uriah the Hittite also. Verse 25. Then David said unto the messenger, Thus shalt thou say unto Joab, Let not this displease thee, for the sword devoureth one as well as another. In other words, when you go into war, there's going to be losses. In other words, David's uh, not too uh, heated up about this. 
Make thy battle more strong against the city, and overthrow it, and encourage thou him. In other words, he's telling the messenger. Verse 26. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. Verse 27. And when the morning was past, David fetched her to his house, and she became his wife. And she bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. As well it should have, because... David has done two big sins here. He's lied with another man's wife, and he's killed a loyal man who is a God-fearing man, apparently. And um, God is not happy with him because of this. In other words, David's power has corrupted him to think that he can get away with anything. 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 1. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him, and he said unto him, There went out two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. Verse 2. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds. Verse 3. But the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him and with his children and did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup. And he lay at it in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. Verse 4. And there came a traveler unto the rich man and he spared to take of his own flock of his herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him and he took the poor man's lamb and killed it, or in other words, dressed it for the man that was come. In other words, this rich man took that, the rich man who had everything, took the poor man's one little lamb, and I think you can probably see where we're going with this. This one man's lamb is going to be symbolic of Bathsheba, and the one man who had the lamb is going to be symbolic of Uriah. And the rich man is going to be symbolic of David. In other words, this is a parable being put forth by God through Nathan to David. Verse 5. And at David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said unto Nathan, As the Lord liveth, that the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. Uh, David is unaware that he has just judged himself. You see a type of this in the parables that Christ put against the scribes and the Pharisees. Because Christ tested them to see whether they could judge right from wrong. And they did by giving them a parable of the man who had two sons. And one son did his bidding and the other son said he would do his bidding but did not. And Christ asked them which of the twain of these, which of these two sons did his father's will. And they said the first, or, or the second, though at any rate, the one that, that did actually went up and got and worked in his father's vineyard. And Christ said unto them, Therefore shall the uh, vineyard be taken from you and given unto others. In other words, they, they judged correctly. They knew right from wrong. And David knew right from wrong. David knew the word of the Lord. He's unaware because this was put to him in parable form that he has just judged himself. Verse 6. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Verse 7. So David's still a fair judge. Except he doesn't realize that he's judging himself. Verse 7. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. Verse 8. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom. And I gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have moreover given thee such things and such things, or such and such things. In other words, I would have given you more, David. 
I would have given you your heart's desire. Verse 9. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord, to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife. Thou hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. He's telling him, you have committed murder by the hand of the children of Ammon. Because God was witness to what happened. God knew about the letter sent by Uriah's own hand to Joab. God is the heart knower, verse 10. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me. Thou hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Verse 11. Thus saith the Lord, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. And I will take wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor. And thou shalt lie with thy wives, or, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. In other words, out in the open. In other words, uh, the uh, analogy here is out in broad daylight, but it's, um, it means out in the open. And he's going to raise the sword against him of his own house. Well, you've got a twofold connotation here. First of all, David's son eventually will rise against him to try to take the kingdom from him, which would be the literal. But out of this house of Judah will come the strangers, the Kenites. And out of the house of Judah, they will come forth and become the priesthood and eventually kill David's seed, which would be Jesus Christ, through the same kind of cunning underhandedness. In other words, to lie in wait to do murder. Verse 12. If thou didst it secretly, or, or for thou didst it secretly, in other words, David, you did this secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. In other words, out in the open. In other words, all Israel is going to see this. Verse 13. <clears throat> and David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord has also put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Verse 14. Howbeit because this deed that thou hast given great occasion to the uh, of the to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child that is born of thee shall surely die. In other words, David's child with Bathsheba, their first child, is going to die. Verse 15. And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child of Uriah's wife that bare unto David, and it was very sick. Verse 16. And David therefore besought the Lord for the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. In other words, no doubt, uh, uh, upon his stomach with his face to the ground before God. Verse 17. And the elders of the house arose and went in to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not. Neither did he eat bread with them. Verse 18. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken to unto our voice. How then, how he then vex himself, or how will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? Verse 19. But when David saw his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Verse 20. And David rose from the earth, and washed, and anointed himself, and changed his apparel, and came into the house of the Lord, and worshipped, then came into his own house, and when he inquired, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Verse 21. Then his servant said unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while he was yet alive? But when the child is dead, thou didst arise and eat bread? In other words, most people 
uh, would uh, not necessarily do the opposite. That they would probably fast and pray while the child was alive, but also when he was dead, they would be hurt and depressed and unable to eat. And um, in other words, this is not quite normal behavior. Verse twenty-two. And he said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? Verse 23. But now he is dead, wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. In other words, David will pass on one day, and then will he see the child, or the the soul that was in that body, but the child cannot return unto him. Verse 24. And David comforted Bathsheba his wife, and went into her, and lay with her, and she bare a son, and she called his name Solomon. And of course we'd already covered that Solomon was of the line of David uh, back a chapter or, to, or so, but uh, this is Solomon who will proceed and be king over Israel who will uh, precede David. And the Lord loved him. In other words, the Lord loved Solomon. And it, it will turn out that Solomon will be the wisest of all. Verse 25. And he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet, and he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. Verse 26. And Joab fought against Rabah, and the children of Ramah, took the royal city. Verse 27. And Joab sent messengers unto David, and said, I have fought against Rabah, and have taken the city of waters. Verse 28. Now therefore gather the rest of the people together, and encamp against the city, and take it, lest I take the city, and it be called after my name. Verse 29. And David gathered all the people together and went to Rabbah and fought against it and took it. Verse 30. And he took their king's crown off his head. The weight thereof was a talent of gold of precious stones. And it was set on David's head. And he brought forth the spoil of the city in great abundance. Verse 31. And he brought forth the people that were therein and put them under Saul's and under harrows of iron, and under axes of iron, and made them to pass through the brick kiln. And thus he did to all the peoples of the children of Ammon, so did all of the people that turn, returned unto Jerusalem. In other words, he, he put them to work. Second, chapter, uh, second Samuel chapter 13. And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. Verse 2. Uh, ye, Amnon, uh, the son of David, loved her. Uh, in other words, she is his sister. Verse 2. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar. For she was a virgin, and Amnon thought it uh, hard, thought it hard for him to do anything to her. In other words, he's he's suffering in in lust is what he's suffering for. Verse three. But Ammon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shemiah, David's brother, and Jonadab was a very subtle man. Verse four. And he said unto him. Why art thou being why art thou being the king's son lean from day to day? Will thou not tell me? In other words, he was depressed. And Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. In other words, this this would be his half sister. He would still be considered incestuous, verse five. And Jonadab said unto him, Lay thee down on thy bed and make thyself sick. And when thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come, and give me meat. 
and dressed the meat in my sight that I might see it, and eat it at her hand. Verse 6. And Amnon lay down and made himself sick, or made himself appear to be sick. And when the king was come to see him, Amnon said to the king, I pray thee, let Tamar, my sister, come and make a couple of cakes in my sight that I may eat of her hand. Verse 7. And David sent home to Tamar, saying, Go now to thy brother Amnon's house, and dress him meat. Verse 8. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house, and he was laid down, and she took flour and kneaded it, and made cakes in his sight, and did bake the cakes. Verse 9. And she took a pan, and poured them out before him, but he refused to eat. And Amnon said, Have all have out of all the men from me have out all men from me and they went every man out from me. Oh, okay. Uh, he's sending everyone away so that it'll be just him and his sister Tamar. Verse 10. And Amnon said unto Tamar, Bring the meat unto, my ch unto the chamber that I may eat of thine hand. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them into the chamber of Amnon her brother. Verse 11. And when she had brought them unto him to eat, he took hold of her and said unto her, Come lie with me, my sister. Verse 12. And she answered him, Nay, my brother, do not force me, for such a thing ought not to be done in Israel. Do not thou this folly. In other words, that, that she knew it was a sin. He knew it was a sin too, but he was overcome by lust. Uh, apparently the seed of David is uh, carried forth here. Verse 13. And I, whither I shall cause my shame to go. Or I, whither shall I cause my shame to go. In other words, if this happens, where shall I cause my shame to go? As for thee, thou shalt be one of the fools of Israel. Now therefore I spray thee, pre speak unto the king, and he will not withhold me from thee. Verse 14. Howbeit he would not hearken unto her voice, but being stronger than she, he forced her, and he lay with her. Verse 15. Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And Amnon said unto her, Arise and be gone. In other words, this was a case of pure lust. And after he got his uh, fulfillment, now he had no further use of her. Verse 16. And she said unto him, There is no cause. This evil in sending me away is greater than the other thou hast done unto me. But he would not hearken unto her. Verse 17. But he called his servant that ministered unto him, and said, Now put this woman out from me, and bolt the door after her. Uh, uh, in other words, there is a deeper connotation here that when a man lied with a woman, they were married. And even though their brother and sister, which was incestuous, uh, he's putting her out of the house because he got what he wanted. Verse 18. And she had a garment of diverse colors upon her, for such robes were the king's daughters that were virgins appareled. And when the servant brought her out and bolted the door after her, Tamar put ashes on her head and rent the garment of diverse colors that was on her and laid her hand on her head and went on crying. Verse 20. And Absalom her brother said unto her, Hath Amnon thy brother been with thee? But hold now thy peace, my sister. In other words, keep quiet about it. He is thy brother. Regard not this thing. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. In other words, depressed and um, shocked after this happening. And she remained there by herself in her brother's house. Verse 21. But when King David heard all of these things, he was very wroth. And Absalom spake unto his brother Amnon, 
neither good nor bad. In other words, he didn't say anything about it. For Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister Tamar. Verse 23. And it came to pass after two four years that Absalom had sheep shearers in Baal Hazor, which is beside Ephraim. And Absalom invited all the king's sons. Verse 24. And Absalom came into the king and said, Behold now, thy servant hath sheep shearers. Let the king, I beseech thee, and his servants go with thy servant. Verse 25. And the king said unto Absalom, Nay, my son, let us not all go, lest we be chargeable unto thee. And he pressed him, howbeit he would not go, but blessed him. Verse 26. Then, Absal then said Absalom, If not, I pray thee, let my brother Amnon go with us. And the king said unto him, Why should he go with thee? Verse 27. But Absalom pressed him, that he let Amnon and all the king's sons go with him. Verse 28. Now Absalom had commanded his servant, saying, Mark ye now, when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say unto you, Smite Amnon, then kill him. Fear not, have I not commanded you. Be courageous and be valiant. Verse 29. Because you, you just don't kill a king's son here, but it's another one of the king's sons commanding him to do so. So they're kind of caught in the middle here. Verse 29. And the servants of Absalom did unto Amnon as Absalom had commanded. And all the king's son arose, and every man got him to his mule and fled. In other words, now they're scared. Verse 30. And it came to pass, while they were in the way... That tidings came to David, saying, Absalom has slain all the king's sons, and there is not one of them left. In other words, a um, little bit's been added to this. Verse 31. And the king arose, and tear his garments, and lay on the earth, and all his servants stood by with their clothes rent. In other words, this again is a sign of mourning, and rage, and anger, and lamentation. Verse 32. And Jonadab, the son of, Jim, of Shemiah, David's brother, answered and said, Let not the Lord suppose, suppose that they have slain all the young men of the king's sons, for Amnon only is dead. For by the, appointed, or, uh, for by the appointment of Absalom, this has been determined from the day that he forced his sister Tamar. In other words, he told him why. Verse 33. Now therefore let not the king take the thing into his heart to think that all the king's sons are dead, for Amnon only is dead. But the, uh, Verse 34. But Absalom fled, and the young man that kept the watch lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there came much people by the way of the hillside behind him. Verse 35. And Jonadab said unto the king, Behold, the king's sons come. As thy servant said, so it is. In other words, I wasn't lying to you. Your sons are alive, except for Amnon. Verse 36. And it came to pass as soon as he has made an end of speaking, that, behold, the king's sons came, and lifted up their voice and wept, and the king also and all his servants wept very sore. Verse 37. But Absalom fled and went to Talmah, and the son of Amihud, the king of Jeshur, and David mourned for his son every day. Verse 38. So Absalom fled and went to Jeshur and was there three years. In other words, he's, he's staying away from David. Verse 39. And the soul of King David longed to go forth unto Absalom, for he comforted himself concerning Amnon, seeing he was dead. And, uh, Probably he uh, comforted him, himself thinking to kill Absalom, but uh, of course Absalom is also his son, so you know he's kind of probably torn in the middle here, but again his rage is probably kindled since this uh, event happened. And um, at any rate, it, it would uh, tear any parrot apart if one child had killed another. 
but Absalom is also his son, so you know he, he he's probably not sure what he wants to do about this, but uh, he probably comforted himself with thoughts of killing Absalom uh, at least in the beginning. Second Samuel chapter fourteen and verse one. Now Joab, the son of Zariah, perceived that the king's heart was toward Absalom. And Joab probably did not know whether uh, the king's heart was toward him for good or for bad. In other words, he doesn't know whether he's ready to forgive him or he wants to kill him for killing his other son. Verse 2. And Joab sent to Tekoa and fetched thence a wise woman and said unto her, I pray thee, feign thyself to be a mourner, and put on now mourning apparel, and anoint not thyself with the oil, with the oil, but be as a woman that had a long time mourned for the dead. In other words, we're going to have a little put on here, a, a ruse. Verse three. And come to the king, and speak on this manner unto him. So Joab put the words in her mouth. In other words, Joab told her exactly what to say to the king. Verse four. And the woman of Tekoa spake to the king on her face, uh, and she fell on her face to the ground and did obeisance and said, Help, O king. Verse 5. And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, I am indeed a widow woman, and my husband is dead. Verse 6. And thy handmaid had two sons, but they strove together in the field, and there was none to part them. But one smote the other and slew him. Verse 7. Behold, the whole family is risen against thine handmaid. And they said, Deliver him that smote his brother, that we may kill him. For the life of his brother whom he slew. And we will destroy the, the heir also. So they shall quench the coal that is left. And there shall not leave to my husband neither a name nor remainder upon the earth. In other words, the underlying thing here is Absalom, of course. And uh, what they're talking about is if David was to kill him, that he would... Uh, Absalom was in line for the throne, uh, probably at this time. And... Um, what Joab is trying to do here is preserve Absalom so he's using a little bit of subtlety through this woman to get David to make a judgment verse 8 and the king said unto the woman go to thine house and I will give charge concerning thee verse 9 and the woman said unto the king O my lord this iniquity be on me and on my father's house and the king and his throne be guiltless in other words lay this charge to me in other words, you, you will be guiltless in this. In other words, a little more uh, deception here to, to get the point across. Verse 10. And the king said, Whoever saith aught unto thee, bring him to me, and he shall not touch thee any more. Verse 11. Then she said, they, then, she said or then said she, I pray thee, let the king remember the Lord thy God, that thou wouldest not suffer the revengers of blood to destroy any more, lest they destroy my son. And he said, As the Lord liveth, they shall not harm an hair, or one hair of thy son falleth to the earth. In other words, no one's going to do him harm. And again, the underlying thing here is Absalom. Verse 12. And the woman said, Let thy handmaid, I pray thee, speak one word unto my lord the king. And he said, Say on. Verse 13, And the woman said, Where there, Wherefore then hast thou thought such a thing against the people of God? For the king doth speak this thing as one which is faulty, and that the king doth not fetch home again his banished. In other words, you're telling me it's okay for me, but for you, uh, Absalom has not been brought home. And David's going to begin to pick up on this here in a second. Verse 14. For we must needs die, 
and are as water spilt on the earth or on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. Neither doth God respect any person, yet doth devise means, and his banished be not expelled from him. Verse 15. Now therefore that I am come to speak to thee, this thing unto my lord the king, it is because the people have made me afraid. And thy handmaid said, I will now speak to the king. It may be that the king will perform the request of his handmaid. Verse 16. And the king will hear and deliver his handmaid out of the hand of the man that would destroy me, and my son together out of the inheritance of God. Verse 17. Then let, uh, verse 17, Then thine handmaid said, The word of the, my lord the king shall now be comfortable, for as an angel, so is my lord the king to discern good and bad. In other words, to judge right and wrong. Therefore the Lord God will be with thee. Verse 18, And the king answered and said unto the woman, Hide not from me, I pray thee, the thing that I shall ask thee. And the woman said, let my lord the king now speak. Verse 19. And the king said, Is not the hand of Joab with thee in all this? In other words, David is pretty good at discernment. And the woman answered and said, As thy soul liveth, my lord the king, none can turn to the right hand or to the left from aught that my lord the king has spoken. In other words, the king, you have, you have the power. And no one can... Uh, Turn away your judgment. For thy, sir, sir, for thy servant Joab, he bade me and put all these words in my mouth, in the mouth of thy handmaid. Verse 20. To fetch about this form of speech hath thy servant Joab done this thing. My Lord is wise according to the wisdom of an angel of God to know all these things, uh, to know all things that are in the earth. In other words, uh, he, he's pretty clever to have figured this out. Verse 21. And the king said unto Joab, Behold now, I have done this thing. Go therefore, and bring the young man Absalom again. Verse 22. And Joab fell to the ground upon his face, and bowed himself, and thanked the king. And Joab said, Today thy servant knoweth that I have found grace in thy, sire, thy sight, my lord, O king and that the thing is fulfilled the request of his servant, or that the king has fulfilled the request of his servant. In other words, that's what all this was about, was to bring Absalom home. Verse 23. So Joab arose and went to Jeshur, and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. Verse 24. And the king said, Let him turn into his own house, and let him not see my face. So Absalom returned to his own house, and saw not the king's face. Verse 25, but, all, but in all Israel there was none to be much praised as Absalom for his beauty. In other words, he was quite the looker. From the sole of his foot even to the crown of his head there was no blemish in him. Verse 26, and when he pulled his head, for it was every year's end that he pulled it. In other words, pulled it means to wrap it around a pole and cut it. Because his hair was heavy upon them, therefore he pulled it. In other words, Absalom had a very thick, curly head of hair. And he weighed the hair of his head 200 shekels after the king's weight. In other words, he, he had quite the head of hair. Verse 27. And to Absalom there were born three sons and one daughter whose name was Tamar. And the woman was of fair countenance. So Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem and saw not the king's face. <clears throat> so basically it's been five years since uh, Absalom has seen his father. Verse 29. Therefore Joab's, or Absalom sent for Joab to have sent him to the king, but he would not come in to him. And he sent again a second time and he would not come. Verse 30. Therefore he said unto his servant, See Joab's field is near mine, and he hath barley there. Go and set it on fire, and Absalom's servant set the field on fire. Verse 31. 
Then Joab arose and came to Absalom into his house and said unto him, Wherefore have thy servants set my field on fire? Verse 32. And Absalom answered, Absalom answered Job and said, Behold, I sent unto thee, saying, Come hither, that I may send thee to the king to say, I am come uh, from Jeshur, and it had been good for me to uh, bend there still. Now there let me uh, see the king's face. And if there be any iniquity within me, let him kill me. In other words, I'm ready to face my dad. And this was the only way I could get you to come and see me. Verse 3. So Joab came to the king and told him. And when he had called for Absalom, he came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king. And the king kissed Absalom. In other words, he was his son. And, uh, you know, bygones be bygones. He had killed his other son, but his other son had done that which was against the Lord. So, you know, he kind of had it coming to him. And I think David probably realizes this, although any time a uh, child is killed, the parents seldom ever um, understand the nature of the killing and uh, seldom ever forgive the person that killed him, even if it was in self-defense. Uh, we've seen events like that recently where... Uh, someone has in self-defense killed someone and you know the parents and all kinds of groups have rallied against this one person who actually was doing nothing wrong when it comes down to it but um, justice cannot appear to the eyes of a parent who has lost a child in other words even when a serial killer is put to death their parents mourn for them and they didn't want them to die. It, you know, it's just a very horrible situation. But God's justice must prevail, regardless of how the human flesh teaches us and accords us to act. At any rate, I think that's a fairly good place to stop for today. And uh, we'll pick this up in 2 Samuel chapter 15. So, longer chapter, or I would go ahead and try to complete it today. But, um, at any rate, we've covered quite a lot of ground here. And Absalom has come home. But, um, what was fulfilled against David was what God said would happen to him. The sword would be upon his house, and it will yet be upon his house. And uh, it's actually been upon his house since that time. If you look down through history at all the uh, monarchs of Europe who are of the king line of Judah, the seed line of Judah, who have killed each other off in um, struggle for the throne. Uh, it's happened many times. It's been written of many times in the um, words of William Shakespeare. Uh, Richard the Third, Henry the Fifth, um, and uh, a, a number of other times, we've seen this happen, where monarchs have risen up against other monarchs. Mary, Queen of Scots, for instance, uh, killed by her cousin, Queen Elizabeth. They were, they were both of the same seed line, and were cousins. But that was over Protestantism and Catholicism. And again, brother against brother in Israel is nothing new. It's quite a common thing, even down to the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, the wars in Europe between the clans of the Highlands and the, uh, the, the Catholic and Protestant wars that went on for years. Brother against brother. Even if you want to take it that far to today, the uh, Arabic people are brothers to the children of Israel. And uh, look at the struggle which has gone forth between them since time immemorial. 
and uh, even continues to this day. And when I say Israel, I mean not only the house of Judah, which is the state of Israel, made up, of course, of the good fig and the bad fig, being the real Israelite children of Judah and the, uh, the Kenite, but also the children of Israel who came from Europe and dwelled in America have been attacked, such as on 9-11 by the uh, Arabic peoples, no doubt at the behest of Kenites who have set up all this to bring about their one world global government, but again, this family has had a long and bloody history of being one against the other, and that's just the way it is, but specifically now, it, we're talking about the house of Judah with regards to what David did, what David's sin was, and what God said upon him, and down through the ages, how that sword has remained upon the house. At any rate, like I said, we're going to stop here for today. And Brothers and sisters in Christ, I always pray for you and beseech you vehemently that you get into this word of our Father and study it diligently. And if you can't devote but 20 or 30 minutes a day to study your Father's word, then do so. Because this is our Father's letter, which was written to us, and He expects us to read it. He expects us to give Him the respect and reverence due a Father. And He expects us to pay Him attention and to love Him. And in this world today, it is not hard to be a shining bright light amongst the children to our Father. A beacon. Because there are so many who ignore Him or lightly esteem him or turn wholeheartedly against him till those who take the time to study if they ask his counsel and wisdom will receive it every man his portion this is our father's promise Again, I hope you're seeing the types and examples and deeper meanings behind all of this. You're going to see more as we go along, but um, may our Father bless you in the study of His Word as you seek His counsel and His wisdom from His Word, those of you who care. And may He reward you with truth and knowledge which has been hidden since time and memorial which even some of the biblical people would have desired to know or been able to see. May God bless you in all your studies as you seek his word and seek his counsel from his word. Thank you for listening. This has been Just Thoughts.